So hello, everybody, and welcome to this evening's uh, webinar. Um, as you know, or anyone who's been on already, we, this is our fifth of five uh, series. Uh, we started off with an introduction, had a history of Palestine, had a, a presentation on life under apartheid. Last week, we had international law on Palestine. And this week, we have how can Ireland most effectively support Palestine? Uh, speaking tonight, uh, presenting tonight are Zoe, Zoe Lawler, our chair of IPSC, and Brian O'Hegartig, uh, our media officer in IPSC. Uh, Donal, our colleague from IPSC, is also on the line uh, just to handle Q&A, and I'm just uh, basically just filling in the bits and pieces. So uh, just for tonight, uh, just to say it's a Zoom webinar. It is being recorded. Uh, we'll have presentations from Zoe and Brian for about 40 minutes, uh, followed by Q&A. Uh, the web, uh, so as yeah, it is being recorded. It's uh, you, uh, it, it, you, when you see your screen, you will see the you, you'll see the presentations, you, you'll see the presenter, and down at the bottom, uh, you've just got effectively three buttons uh, one says chat, one says raise your hand, and one says QA. The only one that you can really engage with because there's so many people on the call, we've almost about 100 people on the call at the moment, is the QA. So you can write your questions uh, in. And we will uh, respond to those questions either verbally or by text. Uh, if you've got other questions or you want to communicate us with with myself or with IPSC on on webinars, etc., you can send us an email at education at IPSC. We also have a short poll which we'll be uh, publishing later. So I'm going to stop speaking now, and I'm going to hand over to Zoe Lawler. So Zoe, you're very welcome, and you have the floor. Thank you, Tom. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming along. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now. Um, so can people see that? Oh, hold on. Yeah, we can see that now. Yeah. OK. OK. Um, so uh, thanks um, for coming along and, and thanks for doing these sessions, Tom. Um, so I'm going to talk mostly about um, the BDS campaign, the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions campaign um, against uh, Apartheid Israel and how we operate it, what we do in the IPSC and then what people can do um, uh, themselves as part of that. So I'm the cultural and sporting liaison for the Ireland-Palestine Solidarity Campaign. So we do a lot of work around uh, the cultural boycott. Um, so our, one of the main tenets of our, of our uh, work is our Irish Artists Pledge uh, to Boycott Israel, which was launched um, in 2010 by Raymond Dean. And um, now we have over 2,150 signatories uh, to the Artist Pledge. So that's a really significant number um, of Irish artists who uh, have pledged to boycott Israel. Normally what happens is I contact artists and I ask them to sign the pledge. Um, I'm kind of obsessed <laughs> when I meet someone who says they're an artist. My first <laughs> question is, have you signed the artist pledge? Um, and I view all artists through the filter of whether they've signed the pledge or not, which is probably unfair, but there you have it. Um, what I find, uh, what we find a lot at like times like the moment when there's such a spotlight on Palestine is that people come to us. Uh, which is great because uh, as everyone knows, we're very stretched at the moment. So finding the time even to contact artists um, is limited, but it does give a lot of weight to other cultural boycott campaigns that we do, that we have this significant number of Irish artists that we can say, um, you know, have shown solidarity uh, with the um, Palestinian people. So something you can do is if you know any artists, um, you can encourage them to sign the uh, artist pledge um, for us. Okay, so we do various actions then around the cultural boycott, like everyone would be aware of the Eurovision campaign, um, which we had in 2019, when the Eurovision was in Israel, and then we revisited uh, the Eurovision campaign this year, not because it was in Israel, but because of the participation of Israel um, in a time of genocide. So we would be part of an international uh, coalition uh, to boycott the Eurovision. I set up a, a coalition, uh, an Irish coalition, and coordinated that um, uh, to call for uh, the Irish broadcasters, to call for the European Broadcasting Union to expel Israel 
from the competition, failing that for them not to participate and for the artist not to participate. So this is just one example. Um, we would put together, uh, write a letter uh, from artists to our artist, Bambi Thug, calling on them to boycott the Eurovision, um, statements from the IPSC, um, a letter from the coalition, as well as letter from the artists. Um, we had a pro big protest at RTE with lots of musicians and speakers. And um, we got a huge amount of coverage, uh, media coverage for this because <laughs> media loves talking about Eurovision as we learned in uh, 2019. Um, so sometimes it's hard for us, and I know Brian will talk about this more, it's hard for us to get a foothold into media, but certainly a campaign um, like Eurovision is something that we really need to exploit because it's an easy in uh, into the media. Um, when artists who are Irish or who are based in Ireland um, are planning to uh, perform in Israel, um, I would contact them privately on behalf of the IPSC. And then uh, if they don't engage um, or they uh, insist on playing in Israel, and it's not many Irish artists to be fair, um, which is a good testament testament to the work that's done here and also to the broad support in Ireland for Palestine. Um, but if they don't engage or they uh, insist on going, uh, we would launch a public campaign asking for them uh, not to go. And then if they were to perform here um, before that, we would have uh, leafleting actions outside. Also, if there's a, an international artist who's planning to play in Israel um, and they're, they have con a series of concerts and there's one in Dublin or in Limerick, wherever, um, we would also leaflet outside there as an awareness raising campaign and to ask people going into the audience maybe to hold up Palestinian flags to encourage them um, uh, not to perform, not to cross the Palestinian picket line. Um, also, I'm sure many of you are aware of the um, South by Southwest uh, Music Festival in the States earlier this year, and all the Irish artists, it was amazing, pulled out uh, due to um, sponsorship from the US military and weapons manufacturers. Uh, so we, um, you know, would have praise them and thank them uh, for, for doing that. And then we also called on Arts Minister Catherine Martin not to attend the festival, uh, which she was doing as part of her St. Patrick's Day um, shenanigans. Um, so that is some of the work we do with the cultural boycott. Then, for example, at the start of uh, this particular uh, round of genocide um, in October, I worked with Sally Rooney to write, it was one of the first letters, international letters from artists, um, uh, put together a letter which was signed by over 600 uh, writers. Uh, calling for a ceasefire and for aid uh, to get into Gaza. Um, here's another example in the pandemic, because of Gaza being under siege, that COVID was so um, threatening to the population there because of the healthcare system. Um, there was an international um, letter calling for an end to the siege of Gaza, and um, I would coordinate getting Irish artists uh, to sign that. Um, so that's uh, the bones of the cultural boycott work. Um, if there's, for example, any Israeli state sponsored events, films, um, individuals um, at, a, say, an Irish festival or whatever, we would work on having that cancelled um, or having the state sponsorship uh, rescinded. So just to note on that, that like... Um, the cultural boy, all boycott is based on complicity, not identity. So an Israeli artist per se is not boycottable unless they meet various criteria. And sometimes there's a little nuance um, in, in the cultural boycott. It's not always clear cut. And that's something that we would get advice from. Uh, we work very closely with our partners in the Boycott National Committee and in PACB, um, you know, to tease out what do we do here? How do we approach this? Um, so something people can do is to, um, as I said, encourage artists to sign the Irish Artist Pledge. And it's great being amazing to see the mobilization in the arts community since this genocide started, but also encourage 
encourage your local arts venues uh, to become apartheid free zones. We're really trying to work on that. And there's a new group called Apartheid Free Arts. And that's kind of one of their main focuses to try and get as many cultural uh, venues and, and uh, sites uh, to sign up to become apartheid free zones. So I think that would be a really strong statement uh, on that. And then if we look at the sporting boycott, I'm sure everyone was aware of the Irish women's um, basketball team uh, played Israel recently. So again, I would write to um, FIBA, FIBA, which is the or Irish boxing or boxing basketball Ireland, sorry, um, and uh, ask them to withdraw from the, the game. Um, generally, I write to all the sporting federations uh, like the um, Olympic uh, Federation or the FAI or whoever, Irish Amputee Association, whoever it is, generally they ignore us. Um, in the case of Basketball Ireland, they sent that kind of uh, stock boilerplate response. Um, so then we had an email action to ask people um, uh, to contact them uh, to boycott. And the same with the FAI for the uh, following few weeks later, there was another 17 uh, girls football match uh, against Israel. Um, and the if there is a match... Um, being played in Ireland um, against an Israeli team, we would have a big demonstration outside. Um, and at the moment now, there's a, a obviously a campaign to have Israel banned from the Olympics. So we're working on that. Um, so something I want to say very much about uh, the boycott, particularly the sporting and the cultural boycott, is you often don't uh, achieve the ultimate goal of the event or the game or the concert being cancelled. However, uh, a big part of this work is raising awareness um, and getting people to talk about what's going on in Palestine, uh, what Israel is perpetrating against the Palestinian people and what we had with the Eurovision and um, the uh, particularly the basketball game because it got a lot of traction because five of the women's team uh, refused to go to Israel and then because the Israelis behaved so badly by having like their soldiers visit uh, their team etc and pose with guns making all our points for us um, is that if, if for weeks the mainstream media um, especially sporting and arts media, we're talking about the cultural boycott of Israel or the sporting boycott of Israel. We're talking about Israeli apartheid. We're talking about the oppression of the Palestinian people. And we're talking about the Palestinian picket line. So uh, that's a really, really, really important part of the cultural boycott. We said it after the Eurovision uh, in 2019, the Eurovision went ahead in Israel. However, we had this really long, uh, successful year-long campaign of raising awareness of centering Israeli apartheid and Palestinian liberation um, uh, there. So I think that's something to, to bear in mind and, you know, don't get downhearted uh, or uh, cast down if things don't work out. The end goal um, often doesn't happen, but it's the awareness raising um, along the way. We had an op-ed in the Irish Times for the Eurovision, um, oh, did loads of media, uh, news talk, um, you know, tonight, um, Virgin Media, etc. All about the Eurovision and about uh, the basketball, the sporting uh, boycott got a lot of coverage there. And particularly now, as a lot of people are coming to Palestine because of what's going on, this particular genocide, but they might not be aware of the 76 years pre preceding this and all the oppression and the apartheid and, um, and and of the boycott. So it's a really good way to engage people outside of just this particular uh, emergency situation uh, of what's going on. Um, we uh, we support the academic boycott, of course, and uh, we don't do a huge amount of work on it because there is a group called Academics for Palestine. But just to say that we, you know, we had a march uh, in solidarity with the Trinity students and their encampment, which was the first one. Uh, and then with the UCD students and I know in Cork and I, I'm, I'm in Limerick, uh, we support uh, the students in, in those um, universities and those groups who are working on uh, the academic 
academic boycott and the academic boycott, as you see from the global campus uprisings all over the world, is really taking off. So again, if you're in any kind of academic institution, you really should be looking, you know, maybe link in with Academics for Palestine or find out what's being done or what you can do to make your institution um, apartheid free. And just back to the sporting for a second, if you're a member of a GAA club or a sporting, any sports club, try and get them to sign up to become apartheid free zones. And that would be a really, um, you know, um, uh, what would you call it, material um, contribution they could make uh, towards uh, solidarity with Palestine. And then if we look at the consumer boycott of Israel, and I guess this is the part uh, that people can participate in uh, the most readily. Um, obviously, um, boycott is a big topic of conversation at the moment. And we've seen polls that indicate, you know, the vast majority of Irish people uh, support the boycott of Israel. So obviously, uh, we are part of that. And we um, have these um, um, brands um, and companies that we um, uh, join the global uh, BDS movement with to boycott. And um, but something very important to note about this, and this comes from the the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, is it's very important that we focus on targeted rather than untargeted. Uh, boycott. So th as they say, they focus on a small number of companies and products for maximum impact. So at the moment, I, there's a kind of a, a tendency for these huge boycott lists, um, which are basically boycotting many most companies. Um, but what we want to see is targeted strategic boycotts and winnable uh, campaigns. So it's important to focus on what we can do, what we can do collectively, what we can be part of an international global campaign, and what we can win. Um, so uh, the BDS, this is from the BDS movement, they have their uh, the consumer boycott targets, the divestment and exclusion targets, the pressure targets, and then the organic boycott targets that have grown up particularly um, around this um, the genocide that's going on um, against the Palestinian people in Gaza. Um, so they again, they have to keep <laughs> putting out um, reminders, I guess, to people to say, you know, we're not boycotting every company. And that don't worry. Uh, you know, if uh, new information comes to light, we will look at that and look at um, uh, adding that company uh, to the BDS list. But they want people to support the existing campaigns and to focus on those. And again, that collective uh, action and movement um, is how we win. Targeted boycott is how we win. Um, so they say here, they look at significant involvement in sustaining the Israeli regime of uh, oppression. And it's good and important to uh, boycott, you know, consumer goods companies, uh, but they want us us all to prioritize the most complicit companies. So I think that's something that's very much uh, we should keep in mind. So with that, like IPSC um, is very much part of the boycott AXA campaign and the, the branches all over the country have actions at AXA offices all the time. And particularly the Meath and the Dublin branch have an action every week. Um, at uh, their local uh, AXA in Dublin. It's the headquarters. And this is um, our vice chair, Fatina Tamimi and Sean Marlowe handing in um, um, a petition into AXA HQ. And uh, it's amazing. Uh, every time we have an action at AXA, uh, they are closed for training. So, you know, you must be the most trained staff in the world. <laughs> so maybe... Um, when they're all trained to a level that um, can't be uh, uh, surpassed, they might actually divest. But even just anecdotally today, a colleague of mine at work told me that she'd stopped her uh, insurance with AXA. And um, when she was on the phone to them, uh, the, the one person in that call centre said she was the fifth person she'd spoken to in the last two days who had cancelled a policy with AXA. So that's how you be effective. Um, we also, uh, there's the Kildare branch at the Boycott HP. We also participate in the Boycott HP campaign. 
um, and we've thousands of uh, signatures on a petition there. So what we can all do collectively is um, obviously boycott all Israeli goods and then see if you're in a local group, um, is there an AXA office near us? Can we link in with um, the Boycott AXA, the Boycott HP, um, the Puba uh, actions? What can we do collectively to be most effective um, around the boycott? And again, I just to reiterate the point is that it's targeted and strategic. OK, and we have had um, victories and um, we had a huge one um, a few years ago when um, Cement Roadstone Holdings, after a 10 year, at least 10 year campaign uh, from us, um, they pulled out of um, their divestment and complicity with um, uh, Israel and uh, build, building the apartheid wall. Uh, so, you know, sometimes a, a campaign is a very, very long one, um, but and sometimes they're localized, like CRH would have been localized to us. But then we're also part of, as I said, the international boycott. So, for example, the Puma campaign and Puma remains a target until this ends, but they have been forced to drop their sponsorship of the um, apartheid Israeli um, uh, team. So I guess a part, a lot of this, and as the BDS movement say, is about showing companies that, look what happened to other companies that are invested in Israeli apartheid and genocide, and this will happen to you, and making Israel the toxic brand that it should be, uh, so that people uh, don't want, companies don't want to be involved in that, not because they care, but because it's just bad for business. Excuse me. And a big part of our campaign, and I this is something that we really want people to get involved in, is um, <clears throat> apartheid free zones. So this is an IPSC uh, uh, initiative, um, part of a global movement, which is supported by different um, uh, Palestine solidarity groups in Ireland and obviously by the BDS movement. So we would encourage people to um, go to your local shop um, if there's a, a zine, um, a cultural centre, a sports club, uh, if you have a business or a space or uh, your, your union and get them to sign up to be apartheid free zones. And if we could roll that out like to, you know, thousands and thousands of um, apartheid free zones around Ireland, that would be a really effective way of raising awareness and of getting people bought in uh, to the boycott. Uh, campaign. I'm just watching. I'm almost out of time here. Uh, so I'm just going to jump then <laughs> small bit differently um, onto um, Shannon Airport. So Brian is going to talk about um, what we can do around um, um, uh, bills, etc. And um, so, as you know, there was a motion before the Shannon on the 29th of May from the Civic Engagement Group um, to ensure that no weapons destined for apartheid Israel travel through uh, Shannon Airport. Um, and the government has kind of kicked that uh, down the road. So I'm, I'm also in a group called Shannon Watch, and we have uh, had for many years a monthly vigil at Shannon Airport. Um, to call for the US military to be not to be allowed to use our supposedly civilian airport. And now because of Palestine, um, it's become a real focus in the Palestinian, uh, in the Palestine solidarity campaign. Um, so um, there was a national demo at Shannon two months ago and all our, our vigils used to be like 12 people on the roundabout and now there's a couple of hundred every time and there were thousands at the national demo. So that's something you should really be lobbying your politicians on, especially as we come up towards the general election on why is the US military using Shannon Airport? Um, are there, why are there plane, military planes going through our civilian airport? And the US are um, active partners in the genocide in Gaza. And uh, why are the planes not inspected? Um, we call for the planes to be inspected at the very minimum, but actually we want there to be no US military presence in our airport. And that's uh, long been the stance. Um, so... Uh, that's my part. Thank you for listening. I uh, hope I haven't gone over time and I'll hand you over to Brian now. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Zoe. That, that was excellent. 
And as Zoe said, we're going to hand you over to Brian now. So uh, Zoe, if you could uh, just stop sharing there and then Brian will start sharing. Are you okay with that, Brian? Just uh, unmute your microphone there, Brian. Certainly. So uh, thank you very much for joining us, everyone. Uh, it's the final session and uh, it's good to be here again. Uh, I am going to uh, share my screen in just a moment and and start up a little presentation for you. So uh, Brian Weigert, the media officer of the IPSC, tackling the important issue, what can we do in this country to support the Palestinian people and to hold the Israeli state to account? Number one, this is what we want to see, legislation, concrete measures. So there are three pieces of legislation that we're looking for. The Occupied Territories Bill from 2018, the Illegal Israeli Settlements Divestment Bill from 2023, last year, the government is still delaying that, and the very recent Air Navigation and Transport, aka the Arms Embargo Bill, from this year. So let's start with the Occupied Territories Bill, tabled in 2018 by Senator Francis Black, working with Fianna Foyle, uh, Niall Collins TD, and working with the organization Sadaka as well. Um, now, this is not a proactive uh, BDS measure. This is simply ending Ireland's uh, complicity in gross state-sanctioned criminality, because it's only with regard to uh, ill-gotten gains of illegal settlements on occupied Palestinian territory. It was supported by every party apart from Fine Gael. So the two other parties in government, the Green Party and Fianna Fáil, they promised that they would enact this bill, broke their promises, uh, everyone supported it, Baron Fine Gael. We'll get into that. Uh, also strongly supported by charities, including Trocra, Amnesty International and Uplift. And supported by legal experts, including the Senior Council in Ireland and the Senior Council in a neighbouring country as well. So we will go to the capable hands of Trocra. What is the Occupied Territories Bill? If enacted, it would ban trade between Ireland and Israel's illegal settlements in the West Bank. Does it only affect Israel? No. Now, the key thing is, we, the IPSC, and I would hope everyone on this call advocates a boycott of the Israeli state, of all produce of the Israeli state. We want sanctions. We want a trade embargo. But this was a modest measure. It was just a little step along the way. It was just one little way to end Ireland's complicity in uh, gross state-sanctioned criminality. It applies only to territories where there is a clear international consensus on the status of the occupation. As it stands, only the occupied Palestinian territories have been confirmed as occupied by the ICJ, but it could in the future uh, apply to other regions of the world which are illegally occupied, such as Western Sahara. Would this result in a boycott of the Israeli state? No, like I say, it's only goods produced in settlements that are illegal under international law. So it distinguishes between Israel and the illegal settlements in the West Bank. It's not a proactive sanction. It's not a sanction. It's simply ending Ireland's complicity in war crimes. Uh, is it compatible with EU law? Now, this bit is important. So we'll be looking at Fine Gael's response in a moment. Uh, exemptions are granted where they can be justified on grounds of public morality, public policy, or public security, and the protection of health and life of humans, which certainly applies in this case. Uh, the legal basis of the bill and its permissibility under EU law are confirmed by two formal legal opinions, Michael Lynn, senior counsel here, and by the way as well, uh, James Crawford, Professor James Crawford, senior counsel in the UK. Here is amnesty on the case, uh, lots of other organisations pushing it hard, as you can see. Here is uh, uh, Niall Collins TD, just stating clearly, this is just the right thing to do. It's something that everyone should get behind. So what happened to this highly popular bill? A core member of the IPSC characterised it as follows. They said, any genuine legal discussions about the uh, permissibility of the Occupied Territories Bill concluded years and years ago. What we're looking at now is political reluctance masquerading as legal misgivings. 
The bill was blocked by Fine Gael on a series of spurious pretexts. What were they? Firstly, the money message, which allows a current government to block any bill that has legal implications on a whim. Secondly, the uh, Attorney General's advice that it wasn't legally implementable. Uh, that was unpublished, unspecified advice. By the way, in the 1980s, uh, a Attorney General, an Irish Attorney General, said that it would be uh, not legally implementable to ban South African apartheid produce. And you know what happened there. So Attorney General's advice can be overturned. Really, they just exist to legitimize the current uh, the current um, the policies of the current government. Next up, we have to claim that trade is an exclusive EU competency. That was a mantra repeated again and again by Fine Gael. And as you saw earlier, that is given the lie by senior counsel in Ireland and senior counsel in the UK as well. And then, of course, they raised the spectre of disinvestment by US firms and the threat of US anti-boycott laws, which would apply to companies based in the US. This was um, in the era of Trump, you know. The unspoken background to all of this, which gives you a little insight into the Irish government, uh, especially Fine Gael, Ireland's UN Security Council bid. So the history to this is very shameful. Um, Ireland was launching a bid. Uh, they wanted to edge ahead of Sweden. Simon Coveney got up on his hind legs and he said all sorts of very earnest things about how Ireland needed to support the Palestinian cause. That got the Arab countries to vote for Ireland ahead of Sweden. And then Simon Coveney, having banked those votes, then got his uh, UN Security Council seat uh, with a fanfare. And then he travelled to the Israeli state and assured them that he would be blocking the Occupied Territories Bill. So, uh, by the way, Ireland on the UN Security Council, what good was that going to be anyway? Because, uh, as you know, the UN, or sorry, the US has a veto there and is going to block any diplomatic measure in favour of the Palestinian people. So, and then you have a little insight into uh, Irish governments, Fine Gael and so forth, who tend to think that they need to store up diplomatic capital, store it up, store it up, by not offending anyone, by not alienating the Israeli state. But that, what's the point in doing that if they're not going to use that diplomatic capital for anything, ever? So that's what we're looking at here. It's it's arrogant and it is delusional. Uh, so the program for government negotiations, and we were launching a very strong campaign, putting them under pressure, reminding Fianna Foyle and the Green Party of their promises. But uh, in the final negotiations, Nessa Harrigan was asked what happened there to the Occupied Territories Bill, which you promised to implement. Simon Coveney happened, was her answer. So Fine Gael forced their coalition partners point blank to drop the bill. We need to see that bill back on the political agenda. It was supported by everyone apart from Fine Gael and supported by all the human rights organizations, legal experts. We need to see that back on the political agenda. The next piece of legislation here, the Illegal Israeli Settlements Divestment Bill. So that was tabled by John Brady of Sinn Féin last year. Um, and that would ensure that the assets of the Ireland Strategic Investment Fund, the ISIF, are not invested in companies which appear on a UN database of companies operating in illegal Israeli settlements on Palestinian land. This is something that we would say any right-thinking person should back this bill. There's no way that Irish taxpayers' money should be invested in companies that are complicit in war crimes. The government have no credible argument against the bill. They didn't have any credible argument against it a year ago. They don't have any credible argument against it now, but still they are delaying it. So that's one we need to see passed as well, the illegal Israeli settlements divestment bill. But I'll tell you a little more about that because the government did do something in relation to it and you'll gain another little insight perhaps into what our government do. So here it is, uh, NTMA looking after the assets of the ISIF uh, with regard to a UN database of companies operating in illegal Israeli settlements on Palestinian land. That's what we're talking about. It's an open and shut case. It's, it is just the right thing to do. Here's Trokra, as you can see, on the case as well. And, uh, you know, as they say, the illegal Israeli settlements divestment bill can help ensure that no Irish taxpayer funds are associated with ongoing breaches of international law. Moving on then, um, the uh, 
Ireland's arms trade with Israel, because Ireland does have an arms trade with Israel. So there was a recent uplift report and it found that Ireland's defence forces have an active contract with Aeronautics Defence Industries, that is a Israeli company that is producing drones that are killing indiscriminately, murdering people left, right and centre in the Gaza Strip, and that Ireland taxpayers' money, €295,000 goes annually to Aeronautics Defence Industries for maintenance of drones that they've already purchased. Uh, uplift reports that no military export licences, no military export licences, have been issued by the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment in respect to exports to Israel since 2014. Two licenses were issued at that stage. But what kind of licenses are they uh, allowing to go ahead? Everyone should check out that uh, uplift. Um, there's a, a quick version to read, a, you know, a, a summary as well. Dual use licenses for exports to Israel. Now, dual use licenses, as you know, are... Um, Goods, uh, goods, including uh, software, including um, intellectual property that are uh, can be used for military and civil purposes. So I, an Irish company would require a license to export such goods outside of the EU. Uh, so dual use exports to the Israeli state increased by over six times over the last number of years and amounted to 70 million. Uh, which is 13% of exports to the Israeli state last year. Now, uh, those licenses are supposed to be granted based on the assessment that goods are not used for military purposes. Um, and there's a stipulation, a criterion that respect for human rights in the country of final destination is a factor. No dual use license application made in 2023 or 2024 was rejected. So that's to say, I think there have been seven or eight of them since the start of this year, since January. I mean, the Israeli state was already arm, up to its armpits in genocide at, this, at that stage. And the Department of Trade uh, was continuing to grant and to renew uh, these licenses. So that's absolutely deplorable. And definitely those licenses should be revoked right now. Now, they, it's, it's, it's very difficult to find out what they're for. They are, they seem to be mostly, the vast majority are for software rather than components. Here is uh, Uplift on the case, and it's a very good uh, report that you should all check out. If you Google Uplift and dual use, you'll find it quickly. Now, what do the IPSC want Ireland to agitate for at an EU level? An arms embargo, number one. Now, as you know, an arms embargo will be hotly contested by Germany, by Austria, by the Czech Republic, by Hungary, by Poland, by the countries that are unilateral supporters of the uh, unconditional supporters of the Israeli state. Also, the Israeli state has preferential access to EU markets via the Euromed trade agreement. And this has to end as well. The Euromed trade agreement gives Israeli state access to EU markets almost as though it was a, a, an EU country. And there are uh, human rights protocols uh, at the heart of the agreement, uh, the Israeli state has never respected them and should never have had access to the Euromed trade agreement for even a second. Here on page two, article two of the uh, of the legislation, which you can find online, relations between the parties, the EU and the Israeli state, as well as all the provisions of the agreement itself, shall be based on respect for human rights and democratic principles, which guides their internal end international policy and constitutes an essential element of this agreement, which uh, the Israeli state, of course, is absolute contempt for. Now, we'll be talking a little more about that because we're looking at a recurring pattern from the government. The government are under tremendous pressure. They're under tremendous pressure from you guys. They're under tremendous pressure from the people in the photo. And the government think, they don't think they can fool you. They don't think they can fool the IPSC. They don't think they can fool the thousands of people marching in the streets, but they think they can fool the wider public or fool enough of them that they can posture as doing something, that they can grab a fig leaf, that they can throw a shape, that they can convince your average voter. They think they can do it. And there'll be people out there saying, so Simon Harris, he's really sticking it to the Israeli state, isn't he? I mean, they're fuming with him. Look, look what Netanyahu said. 
the government think they can fool the people and we need to make sure they can't. So look at this, February, 2024, the government with figures such as Michal Martin never having made a public utterance about the Euromed trade agreement before, and you can Google that, they never said a thing about it. Leo Varadkar never said a thing about it. Michal Martin never said a thing about it. Suddenly they fixated on this Euromed trade agreement. Uh, so here you have um, Leo Varadkar, who's very earnestly trying to build consensus for having Israel suspended from the Euromed trade agreement. Of course, there's a get out clause there because they know that this will be blocked by Germany, Austria, Czech Republic, and so forth. But yes, this will suffice. The Irish government then will be able to posture as doing something and they'll fool some of the people. Following month, March, 2024, the government moots recognition of a Palestinian state. At this point, um, at this point, Leo Varadkar was still in office. So as you can see, he gives himself a little get out clause there again, the circumstances are right, he's waiting for. What to say about that? And what does the IPSC say about recognition of a Palestinian state? So that's going to happen now. The Palestinian flag was hoisted over Leinster House. And what we say about that is recognition of a Palestinian state doesn't mean a thing unless it is followed by concrete measures, by the legislation that we're talking about here. But as you can see, from this uh, little analysis here, again and again, the government is just looking for little things they can posture as doing. They will do anything other than legislate. Following month, uh, remember the Illegal Israeli Settlements Divestment Bill, which was uh, the ISIF, which was looked after by the National Treasury Management Agency. So the National Treasury Management Agency stepped up and did the right thing. They divested from UN blacklisted companies, citing their risk appetite, which is the, the thing that com, uh, banks and so forth will cite when they don't want to do this and they want to do that instead. But there was no legislation. So there's nothing to stop the National Treasury Management Agency going back and reinvesting in these companies uh, or different companies that are complicit in war crimes at a later point. What we want is legislation. So again, the government postured as doing something, anything but so here we have it. Minister McGrath notes NTMA confirmation of divestment, but no legislation. They're still blocking, delaying that bill. So in short, we have a government who will do anything but legislate to end Ireland's complicity in Israeli war crimes. And we need to continue to push them. We need to educate the public. We need to have those conversations. There's people out there who think that Simon Harris is really doing, he's really sticking it to the Israelis. And we need, to, we need to continue to shout about that and we need to make sure that people know. So this is a long running campaign. This is, as you know, the background to the current carnage is settler colonialism, is apartheid. So we call upon the Irish government to admit that the Israeli state is committing the crime of apartheid. There's a growing consensus among human rights organizations, legal experts, which human rights organizations? Batsalem, the Israeli state's foremost human rights organization, Human Rights Watch, uh, Amnesty International, and so on. Uh, so the IPSC was in a coalition, still is in a coalition with a number of other NGOs, including Trokra, Amnesty, um, uh, Konov, and so on, to force the government to recognize that what's happening is apartheid under international law and to use its position multilaterally, including at the UN, to compel the Israeli government to dismantle the system of apartheid. Now, I'm not going to have as much time to talk about media stuff as I would like today, but as you know yourself, the, there isn't sufficient exploration in the media of the fundamental fact that history didn't begin on the 6th of October or the 7th of October, and that honestly, the context of all of this is apartheid, it's settler colonialism, it's a 17 year illegal siege of the Gaza Strip, uh, it's the fragmentation of the West Bank, uh, that's, that's the context here. And there has been very, very little mention, unless we're really pushing for it, there's very little mention of the term apartheid, which is the consensus among human rights organizations. So we need to continue to push for that as well. This was our flagship leaflet. 
in the, uh, you know, before the current uh, conflagration. And as you can see there, it's pushing to basically have the Irish government tell it like it is and take effective action to stop it. So that, oh yeah, I want to get back to you with those book recommendations. Two book recommendations, same ones as I said in the initial session. Uh, I recommend that you get these. Ben White's Israeli Apartheid, A Beginner's Guide, and Ilan Pape's 10 Myths About Israel. And that concludes my presentation. Uh, there you see the books. And thank you very much. And now I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and thank you, Zoe. Uh, and uh, I think we, we've certainly covered a lot there. Um, so uh, I would encourage people to uh, to uh, uh, give it, send in some questions if you if you've got them, um, and uh, we we'll we'll handle those either verbally or uh, or by text. I just want to put I just want to uh, launch a quick poll. It's a very simple poll. I think if I if this if this will work. Um, can people see that poll? I think, yes, you can see that on your screen. So basically what we're just saying, where we're just trying to get a feedback from people. Uh, have you, are you interested in attending other similar type IPSC webinars in October uh, slash November timeframe? Uh, yes, no, or not sure. Um, so I'm just gonna give a couple of more seconds. Maybe it's a very simple question. Uh, we just, I think the feedback we've got so far has been pretty positive on these. People have found them uh, useful for different reasons. Um, and I will be uh, putting together a um, a survey, uh, not a long survey. I, I think most people, when they hear about surveys, they just think, oh my God, uh, no. So I, I want to put together a short survey just to get your feedback. I think I've had individual emails to education at ipsc.ie in terms of uh, what might be, uh, what they might find of interest. Uh, I, I think maybe uh, so effectively, we've got 99% of people saying, yes, they would be interested in attending um, in attending uh, uh, the webinars. So that's good. 1% uh, not sure. And nobody said 0% uh, said no. So thank you very much for that. Just short straw poll. Um, uh, I think as well, uh, the survey will ask a question like, do you want more of this type of presentations we've had from different presenters or do you want different different uh diff different areas covered so anyway I, i'll 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 uh, follow up with that after after the um after this session so just the um brian could you repeat the names of the authors uh, uh names of the books and the authors again uh, yes indeed so the first one is ben white's israeli apartheid a beginner's guide uh, it's a very slim volume, and it basically does exactly what it says on the tin. Um, the other one is Ilan Pape's 10 Myths About Israel, which demolishes 10 popular. Now, he's uh, one of the Israeli state's preeminent historians. Uh, we've had him as a, as a speaker in Dublin and around the country, and he just uh, demolishes one after another of the Hasbara narratives that the Israeli state depends upon. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. We've got another question there. It's focusing, it's coming in from an organization, uh, someone, I guess, involved in the Irish Healthcare Workers for Palestine. And uh, so they're asking maybe uh, how, what, what could an, a professional organization, uh, how could a professional organization respond as opposed to how we can respond as individuals? I think it would be true to say that professional bodies, the formal professional bodies uh, have not really responded positively in support of Palestine. I know we on the marches, of course, we've had wonderful uh, pres uh, demonstrations and and solidarity from uh, people involved, healthcare workers, et cetera. Et cetera. But the organisation them themselves, the formal organisation, like the Irish Medical Council, or uh, where you know doctors, nurses, healthcare workers are being slaughtered in Gaza. We haven't seen uh, not that I, I not that I'm aware of. We haven't seen formal uh, condemnation from these organisations. So uh, I suppose the question being asked is, what could can we suggest anything that uh, to to people involved professionally uh, from IPSC? Maybe Zoe, maybe could could you respond to that? Uh, 
Yeah, sure. And um, thanks for the question. Um, so yeah, I, I'm just, this is the part on Tiva. I mean, really, the, there is a lot of work being done on ethical procurement. Um, so um, what you can kind of do, <laughs> so we're doing this in, in UL at the moment, is where there are contracts with complicit companies um, to make the uh, procurement people aware of the BDS movements list and um, uh, the UN blacklist um, and the the different uh, who profits and the uh, Quakers lists um, to draw up an ethical procurement policy. So often they can't get out of contracts, but the point is that contract isn't renewed um, on an ethical clause or that, that there are all alternatives. Um, in the HSC, I imagine, is tied up in that kind of procurement morass, um, but that would be something to work on uh, to try and get a dialogue with the procurement people. Um, also, what you might do then is speak to like local practitioners and pharmacies, etc., and ask them how can they source alternatives and that could they make some noise around this, um, which would force the issue. I think a lot of this has to come from below. It won't come uh, from above. And then on the question of um, aerial university, I mean, most Israeli universities um, are complicit, uh, deeply complicit in Israeli apartheid. There's a lot of advice on the academic boycott on the um, BDS movement um, uh, website. Um, and what I would say is it's not appropriate for national professional organizations to be associated with these Israeli professional organizations through joint enterprise. So that would be something for the world physiotherapy or, or the I don't know if it's the Irish, I, I don't know these, um, but that you should talk to those organizations um, about not cooperating or collaborating with these uh, institutions and um, you can also link in with academics for palestine if you need advice on that but that's the work that's being done in the various um colleges and universities at the moment is to say okay there are these links we want these links um gone <clears throat> you know uh, so i think does that answer that yeah brian um, i just to jump in there briefly if I understood the latter question correctly, say you are, for instance, uh, a librarian and you are, for instance, a member of the Library Association of Ireland, and you're saying, good God, uh, librarianship is supposed to be the the the, the profession of, of, of media literacy and ethics and, and so forth. But here they are having nothing whatsoever to say about Israeli apartheid and genocide. Well, here I have a little toolkit what I would say is, look, do a Google search, see if the organization made a statement with regard to uh, Putin's invasion of Russia. We're not going to get into the whys and wherefores now, but the point is, did they make a statement in relation to that? They probably did. Uh, see if you can draft a similar statement. They made a statement in 2022. Uh, can you make a similar statement now, the same wording, and it would be a very hard case to answer, why can't they do that? Um, you know, find out when the AGM is, find out when motions have to be in by, try to get that off the ground. Also, maybe you could send a letter to the papers about that as well. So feel free to talk more about that. But that's what I would do. Look to what they said, look to what the organization said in relation to Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine and see if you can replicate that. They'd have, you know what I mean? They, they, they can't really make a case against it. Yeah, we've got a question there on BDS and the question is says, Don't, doesn't uh, BDS harm Palestinian workers? Uh, and I think our, our answer to that, IPSC's answer to that would be, uh, the BDS has been called for by Palestinian civil society in 2005 and since then, right? So uh, regardless, uh, and they obviously have have taken made that call in full knowledge that you know uh, some Palestinians are in many cases forced to work for Israeli companies because that's their their only only li livelihood. But uh, so yes, it, it, we're following the Palestinian call of civil society on that one. Um, second question. Uh, sorry, Tom. Just yeah, on sure. that, just yeah. to say that all the main Palestinian uh, trade unions have also called for BDS. Um, and they have put out a renewed call in this genocide for um, 
you know, support, solidarity and to escalate uh, the boycott. And uh, nothing harms Palestinians more than genocide and apartheid. Uh, so, you know, that's the the the, the call there. And, um, you know, that like a lot of the arguments that are trotted out against um, boycott were also used by um, the South African apartheid regime. Um, you know, you can actually see the 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 parallels um between them. Um, but if any, you know, Palestinians, Palestinian workers will have full rights in a free Palestine uh, that they certainly don't enjoy uh, now. Okay, there's also a question there uh, uh, about should the Irish government be more focused on dialogue and peace build peace building rather than on boycotts, sanctions, and isolation. Of, of Israel. Zoe, I'll leave you. No, <laughs> no, sorry. I mean, like I said this, um, we have a demo every Saturday in Limerick and I said in my speech on Saturday that the notion of like kind of dialogue um, and at the moment is laughable. I mean, the Israelis are constantly saying we don't care. Um, we don't sign up to any any kind of process. Um, and we're continuing with this genocide. And the reason that they can continue to commit the crimes they commit is because of the impunity that the international community, which includes Ireland, has granted them for 76 years. So we absolutely have to sanction Israel. I mean, they literally can do whatever they want because there's no consequence. And that's why, you know, you get the when they bombed the first hospital, and they said, oh, my God, we would never bomb a hospital. How dare you accuse us of this? And now they've bombed all the hospitals because nothing happened. Nothing happened when they bombed the refugee, uh, the people in the tents. So now they've been bombing them all week in the tents uh, in Al Mawasi in the uh, designated safe zone. So really, Ireland is very complicit in the culture of impunity that has enabled this genocide. And, you know, talking, I mean, where. This is what dialogue has brought us to, to genocide. So, no, we absolutely must uh, sanction Israel and enact every, like Simon Harris said, we have to use every lever at our disposal, but he actually didn't mean use any of the levers that we have at our disposal. Um, so as Brian said, you know, they're trying to hide behind um, kind of symbolic gestures, but we need them to take concrete action. And that's what people should be hammering home to them. Right. OK, thanks. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, fully agree. And uh, for people who've been following Palestine for and the Israeli Palestine situation for many years, uh, you will know that, uh, you know, there was a so-called peace process called the Oslo Accords, et cetera, which uh, the, during the entire par uh, duration of that process, the Israel accelerated the, build, the building of settlements on in the West Bank uh, uh, and and therefore just uh, it was the the so-called peace process dialogue, whatever, was an absolute shambles, uh, and Palestinians got nothing from it. Okay, there's a question there. In the North of Ireland, is there any legislation the IPC uh, is calling on to the Assembly and the Executive to enact? Um, I'm not aware of any. Uh, similar, to, I guess you're speaking about like the Occupied Territories Bill. Is there a similar bill? Uh, has been tabled uh, in the north? I'm afraid that I don't know enough to say. I did a quick Google on it there. And yeah. um, if somebody if somebody on the call knows the answer to that question and if they if they um uh send it to education at IPSC, I'll certainly circulate it, right? I would say in the in the north what you'd be looking for is um you know the the repressive anti boycott legislation and stuff that the British government were trying to bring in uh to not be enacted especially okay. yeah right. but specific legislation I don't know okay I just wanted to uh, say again that uh the 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 record the, the recording of this will be it was a question asked about when when will it be available uh we've got a little bit of editing and stuff to do on these recordings and they will be available probably in the next week or so uh we will also put together the slides um as i said we we will have a short survey uh and uh, we want to have a space where where uh, we want to keep this as a dialogue between ourselves and yourselves and so if 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 you've got strong views uh, as regards what you think we should be doing as a follow on from this, we'd like to hear from you. OK.
Um, I think that, okay, we're, we're just after eight o'clock now. So uh, unless there's any more questions or unless our, our panelists wants, wants to uh, just, oh, we, uh, we may have one or two more questions there, but if our panelists want to just put, uh, say any com uh, concluding words, maybe. Actually, I think maybe uh, we have an answer coming in there, which uh, it says the oh, assembly Sue. passed. Thanks, Sue. Yeah, <laughs> the assembly passed a ceasefire uh, now motion last month. It calls for immediate ceasefire, immediate recognition of the state of Palestine, and an end to the British government's arms trade with Israel. It did not address UK suspension of UNRWA funding. So thank you for that. Yeah, sorry. And like all all calls would be like the end of an arms trade and military embargo. Yeah. Yeah, and all, all trade. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Have we any concluding words, Brian or Zoe, before we um, finish up? Just thank you very, very much for joining us. And we will hopefully see you soon. We are going to continue to do what we do. Uh, we'll see you on the streets. Uh, check out our social media. And we will be doing, hopefully, doing some more of these solidarity sessions with some great guests uh, before long. Okay. So, and, uh, can I jump yeah, in? Sure, here? Sure. Sorry, just I don't know who's on the call, but I think there's lots of people from different branches around the country. So, I just want to acknowledge the amazing work that people are doing in all the different branches and the different groups around Ireland. It's incredible to see. Um, I'm based in Limerick, so I'm trapped in a Saturday every week. I know it happens in Ennis and in uh, Cork, and uh, all around the, the branches are doing uh, some kind of weekly action. Uh, demo vigils etc and and other people who aren't in branches and um, but encourage them to join um so it's really great to see so well done keep it up um you know and we always say to people like we get a spike in kind of interest and activism when there's a really violent um attack on on palestine but there's a constant violence, which is the whole repressive system. So we want people to stay with us, stay with the movement, stay with the struggle, uh, keep going. And if there's a ceasefire, you don't stop. You keep it up. There's huge momentum here now. I've never seen engagement and activism um, like it. I've never seen the buy-in and the just horror at what's going on from so many people. So we really have to make sure that we keep that going and translate it into uh, forcing uh, meaningful action for Palestine and maintaining this immense solidarity uh, with the Palestinian people. And also we have a, our next national demonstration is on the 20th of July. So we hope to see you in Dublin uh, for that. So uh, thanks for listening and um, boycott apartheid Israel all day, every day and uh, keep it up. Free Palestine. See you soon, folks. Yeah. All the best yeah. now. So thank you, everyone. And we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.